Today, at the Channel Points request of Carol, we are going to review one of the most underrated films I've ever seen in my entire life. Released in 1988, Lady in White is classified as a supernatural mystery film and was directed, produced, written, and scored by Frank Lalogia. The film centers around nine-year-old Frankie Scarletti, who sees a vision of a girl who was murdered in his same classroom ten years earlier. After being attacked by the same murderer, Frankie vows to solve the mystery of the girl's murder, as well as maybe preventing his own. Frankie was played by Lucas Hawes, who has gone on to be in more than 50 films, as well as have a decently successful music career. There were also some well-known actors in this film as well. Frankie's dad, Angelo, was portrayed by Alex Rocco, who you may recognize as Mo Green from the Godfather movies. His friend Phil was portrayed by Len Carew, who was also the original Sweeney Todd in the original Sweeney Todd film adaptation in 1979. And Catherine Heldman also played the mysterious Amanda Harper, and she she had starring roles in Soap in the 70s as well as Who's the Boss throughout the 80s and early 90s. So despite receiving positive reviews from critics, this film absolutely bombed at the box office. It cost about $5 million to make and only made back about $1.7 million. So before Carol had requested this, I had never actually seen this film before other than hearing it was pretty underrated. And I gotta say, it is a tremendous film. The acting in this film was tremendous, which shouldn't really surprise you considering the cast. The story was fun and it was a great mystery thriller, which also had some great horror spiced in. And I gotta say, the soundtrack to this movie is tremendous. Again, Frank Lologia did everything for this movie. He produced it, he wrote it, he directed it, and he did the soundtrack. And I gotta say, out of all those things, the soundtrack here might be his biggest accomplishment. It is absolutely tremendous. I do want to warn you going into this though, there is some very strong material in this, like child murder. So just letting you know ahead of time that if that's something that's off-putting to you, even, you know, in film sense, that is very strong in this movie. And one thing I liked about this movie is if you're going to use strong themes like that, it has to be essential to the plot, you know? Doing like, oh, let's just do a child murder scene just to do it, you know, is pretty fucked up and very off-putting. But it's not off-putting if it makes sense towards the film and has a satisfying conclusion. And this film absolutely did. But how do we end up getting there? And can Frankie keep himself alive? Well, we're gonna find out right now as we review Lady in White, 1988. So our film begins with a mystery novel writer who's picked up from the airport in a taxi. So he and the taxi driver visit the graves of Melissa Ann Montgomery and also Ann Montgomery, and the taxi driver asks him if he believes all those stories that he wrote. And turns out the mysterious writer is actually the older version of our main character, Frankie. And now it's time to meet younger Frankie, who lives in a quiet town with his dad, Angelo, his brother, Gino, as well as his grandparents. It's Halloween 1962, and during his school's Halloween party, Frankie tells a story that he wrote about some kind of monster who's gonna kill everybody, but it's okay. They destroyed the monster, it's fine, but what if the monster had a kid? Alright, that's enough, Frankie. So then these two douchebag kids, Donnie and Louie, hide Frankie's beanie, and then they tease him about it after school. Oh, and also turns out Donnie is just straight up racist, and it caught me way off guard. Like, he just drops the N-word with the hard R, like, out of nowhere. But it's okay, because Frankie then knocks him the fuck out. Frankie then goes back into the school to retrieve his beanie, avoiding the school janitor Harold Williams as he does so. As he's looking for his beanie in the coat room, though, Donnie and Louie sneak in and lock him in there, just to be massive dicks, I guess, and then they run away. Well, Frankie can't really do anything but sleep it off, and he does just that, and then he has a terrible dream about his mother's funeral. And then he wakes up and sees the ghost of a girl his age talking to an invisible person, and now this invisible person is murdering her. This is one of those brutal scenes I was talking about. Like, the other guy's invisible, like, you don't see someone physically choking her, but, like, they still show the reenactment, and it's pretty messed up. And after her lifeless body floats out of the room, somebody real's coming in now. Uh-oh. And this mysterious person seems to be here to check the vent on the ground in the coat room. Frankie tries to avoid him by staying in his hiding spot, but he's quite literally ratted out. After noticing Frankie, the man then begins to strangle him, and Frankie has a near-death experience where he's flying towards the sun. He then ends up at his own grave where he meets the ghost girl, who identifies herself as Melissa. Melissa tells Frankie that she lost her mom, and Frankie promises to help her find her. Back in reality, however, Frankie wakes up as his dad has found him and successfully gave him CPR. 
The police then raid the building and find the janitor drunk in the basement and promptly arrest him. So Frankie's now at home and wearing a neck brace and Gino shows him a newspaper article talking about 11 kids that have been murdered in the same town in the last 10 years and the killer was never caught. Frankie takes a look at that for himself and he realizes that the first child murdered was none other than Melissa. Frankie is then visited by family friends Toby and Phil, and Phil bought him a new bow and arrow. That's pretty nice. Also turns out Phil and Angelo are extremely close and they're pretty much brothers, as Phil lived with Angelo growing up after his parents died. So Frankie goes to sleep that night and things start moving around in his room, and looks like Melissa's just having some fun. But then things start going really fast and oh Jesus Christ, that is not Melissa. No, that appears to be the mysterious Lady in White, a town legend who is known for haunting a house by the cliffs. But anyway, the next day they're in church and the pastor is, you know, saying pastor stuff about how all the kids who were murdered are now with God, but the mother of the kid most recently murdered does not seem to take too kindly to that. And then she blames the murders on Harold's family, who are just chilling in the back of the church. Like, what the hell, dude? They try to leave, but Harold's wife faints, and Angelo, being the good guy he is, drives them all home. Sometime after that, Detective Frankie heads back to the school to see what was inside that vent. And inside the vent, he finds some child's toys as well as a high school class ring. Frankie devises that the toys were from the victims, and the class ring must have been from the murderer himself, and that's probably what he went back to the coat room to go and find. Frankie then goes home because he got a new typewriter in the mail, but as he's doing that, he accidentally drops the ring. His suspicions about the ring are then confirmed when he overhears a conversation between the police chief and Angelo, where the police chief tells Angelo that Melissa was indeed murdered in the same coat room 10 years prior. But speaking of the ring, Gino finds it back at home, and he takes it, because he's a dick, I guess. So either the next day or later that same day, Frankie is walking past the house of Amanda Harper, a woman who apparently went crazy and tried to burn her own house down. She's back living there now though, and she can sometimes be heard playing piano. Frankie then meets up with Donnie and Louie, and dude, really? These guys locked you in a coat room. Why the hell are you still hanging out with these two? And then Donnie and Louie are like, hey, you wanna go check out the Lady in White's abandoned house? And Frankie's like, okay, and I get it, he's nine, but dude, come on. These two almost got you killed. So they go to the haunted house and Donnie pranks them by using a baby alligator that he bought and I know it's a small town, I know it was the 80s, but how the hell did they let a nine-year-old buy a baby alligator? The alligator then escapes and they chase it throughout the house until they end up in the master bedroom. And inside the bedroom, Frankie finds a picture of the lady in white with Melissa, revealing to him that the lady in white is actually Melissa's mother. And speaking of the lady in white, turn around, douchebags, because here she is. Donnie and Louie run off, and then Frankie sees her too, and he also bolts out of there. He runs away from the forest before he's promptly tackled by Gino, who he swiftly kicks in the dick. So Frankie tries to tell Gino everything that's been going on, but Gino doesn't really believe him, which is understandable. And Frankie then tries to show him the ring, but then he realizes that he lost it. And back at home, turns out Gino is trying to clear the initials on the ring so he can compare it to his dad's old high school ring. And upon returning to his room, he sees the ghost of Melissa. Believe Frankie now? The clock then strikes 10, however, and Melissa goes back to the school to get murdered again. Frankie then realizes he needs to see her to her conclusion in order to find out what really happened to her. So Melissa's body was taken to the cliffs in front of her house and turns out she wasn't really dead. She woke up screaming, but then she was thrown right off the cliffs by the killer. Her mother then ran out of the house, but upon seeing her dead, she too yeeted herself off the cliff. So the next day, Harold Williams is found not guilty due to lack of evidence. And oh look, that crazy mother from before has come to apologize. And by apologize, I mean shoot him right for the head. Dude, what the fuck? Well, I guess let's check up on Gino. Oh, it looks like he cleared that initial, MPT. Who the hell is MPT? Well, turns out MPT stands for Michael Phillip. Terra Grossa. Oh shit. So where is Phil now, you might ask? Oh well, nowhere. He's just out doing archery with Frankie in the middle of nowhere. So Phil and Frankie shoot some arrows and then they pack up and Frankie is humming Did You Ever See a Dream Walking, which was the same song that Melissa was singing earlier. 
Also, random fun fact, that song was also used in the end credits of A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, which I literally did on the channel the last week. But then, Frankie has an oh shit moment as he realizes that Phil is whistling the exact same song. And then Phil has an oh shit moment as he realizes that Frankie knows. So Frankie locks himself in the car and Phil goes crazy and tries to attack him. Frankie escapes the car and Phil chases him in the forest where he tells him, Hey dude, if I had seen you under that mask, I wouldn't have attacked you and tried to murder you, which honestly isn't really that comforting. So they end up at the lady in white's house and Phil starts choking Frankie to death until he's knocked out from behind by somebody. So Frankie wakes up in the house bedroom with a bunch of candles and oh, there's Lady in White playing piano. But that's not the Lady in White at all. That's actually the crazy lady, Amanda Harper, and turns out that she is the sister of Anne Montgomery. And yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Her whole world fell apart and she went crazy after her sister and niece died. But she reassures Frankie, don't worry, I killed Phil. But uh-oh, jump scare. No, you fucking didn't. So Phil starts beating up Amanda and lights the whole damn room on fire before beating her to death. He then picks Frankie up and carries him out of the house and drags him over to the cliffs. They then have actually a super tense battle where Phil's trying to throw him off and Frankie's trying to hold on to him. But then, oh shit, the lady in white shows up and she zaps Phil to fuck off that cliff. And guess who else is here? That's right, it's Melissa and mother and daughter have finally reunited and they can finally die in peace, and they do that as they turn into balls of light and go into the sky. Well anyway, all's well that ends well, right? Yeah, not quite. Phil's still alive. But luckily Angelo and the police show up and Angelo's able to pull Frankie out of harm's way. And then Angelo offers Phil his hand, and dude, I get it, he's one of your oldest friends, but he just tried to murder your son, not to mention he killed ten other children. Luckily though, Phil can't bring himself to take his hand, and he falls to his death off the cliff. The film then ends with everybody watching the Montgomery house burn down to a crisp as it begins to snow. Not gonna try to save Amanda, she's still in there, you know, eh, whatever. You know what's crazy is Carol's been one of my longest term viewers and she's never used her channel points on anything until she used them on this. And this, Carol, I gotta say, was a very, very good use of channel points. Had she not done that, I probably would have never ended up hearing of this film. I probably would have never seen this film in my entire life. And honestly, I'm very glad I've seen it. It's an incredibly sad tale and it's an incredibly brutal tale, but it's also an incredibly well-told tale. The only thing that doesn't hold up about this film is some of the green screen effects. Those were very 80s, but everything else, you know, the soundtrack. Again, I cannot stress how great the soundtrack is in this film. You can find the whole thing, the whole hour-long soundtrack on YouTube. The opening song in particular is just tremendous. The acting, again, is great. Fantastic cast. They got some good actors for this. The plot is somewhat unique, and of course it's based off a legend, but I'm not really sure if it's a legend really brought to film instead of this one. And I gotta say, it's really a shame that nobody really knows about this film, because it's just tremendous, and I would definitely recommend watching it. And really, that's my conclusion. Go watch this film. It's fucking great. Watch this film. Tell your friends about this film. It's worth seeing. But that's going to do it for me today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you again to Carol for using her channel points on this. It is one of, if not the most underrated film I've ever seen, and I would definitely recommend go checking it out. You can actually find the whole film on YouTube. Like, I'm not kidding. You can find the whole film on YouTube. It's not in very good quality, but you can find it. And I would definitely recommend either watching it there, or if they actually remastered it, I think, into Blu-ray in 2015. There was even an extended cut. So yeah, go check it out. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is going to do it for me today. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Uh, thank you to all 71 of my patrons listed in the description for supporting me and my channel. With all that being said, though, my name is Noah Taff. This has been my review of Lady in White 1988, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.